It's great to be here. Um, what I'm going to do, or hopefully do, in the next 20, 25 minutes is I'm not going to tell you about solvency because I don't know very much about it. Um, I'm not going to talk about marketing strategies or how to increase your sales or how to make a social media campaign. I can advise about that, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk, I'm really going to tell you a story about the CEO who became a caddy, who nearly came back. And you might get some inspirations, some insights and ideas if you're coping with change at the moment. And that might be change within your business, or it might be personal change, it might be big change, it might be small change. Because certainly what I've found, and hopefully you will hear, is that there could be some very difficult times that you have to cope with, but some good things could really come out of it uh, quite positively. So let me tell you a bit about me. Uh, as you can hear, I'm English, but I've lived up in Scotland now for 30 years. Uh, I went to college there when I was 18, and then after college I had various roles in sales uh, up in, in, in Scotland, and then I got a role in marketing for one of the insurance companies there. And uh, when I got to about 26 or 27, I then went to join a marketing and design agency in Edinburgh. And I loved that. I thought, uh, the, the main reasons I loved it was, first of all, it, it, I was working lots of different kinds of clients, and they were in the creative world, which I really enjoyed. But secondly, and probably more importantly, I enjoyed the entrepreneurial spark of that company. I was there for about four years, and then round about 90, whoop, did, there you go. Then round about uh, 95, 96, I came to the conclusion that I was going to set up my own agency. So when I was about 30, 31, I came to the conclusion that I was going to change my own agency. I was going to set up my own agency. And then this happened, the World Wide Web. Now, for you young people, it probably seemed a long time ago, but it is. But about 95, 96, the internet wave was just starting in the UK. And when I was at that agency, I was asked a lot by these companies that we did a lot of work for, that were saying, what is the World Wide Web? You know, what is a website? Could you build us a website? And we got asked that more and more. And then in 1996, I came to the decision and said, actually, I'm not going to build, I'm not going to set up a marketing and advertising agency. We're going to build websites. So me and another guy, uh, as you can see, a bit thinner, I was then, but a guy called Kevin. Kevin was technical, I was sales and marketing. And in 1996, we set up a business called Company Net. And our, our, our belief was right. The wave absolutely started. And we were being asked a lot of times to build, at the start, big public websites. So we did a lot of work for the Scottish Government. We did the first Scottish Government website. We did a lot of public sector work. We did a lot of work for people like Standard Life and the Scottish Whiskey Association. And it was really exciting days. You know, it was all new, it was all innovative. And then, bizarrely, we got a phone call from a company here, 20 miles from here, from Tamworth. This is really weird. Uh, from a company called Physico. Some of you might know Physico. They might still be there. I'm not sure if they're still there. But Physico uh, produced consumables for the foundry uh, country, uh, for foundry industry. And what they wanted, they didn't want to do a public website, they wanted to build what was called an extranet. Now everybody knows about secure websites now. Amazon, down to your bank, you log in, you get personal information. But back in 97, 98, this was completely new stuff. And what they wanted was to build a secure website that would allow their customers to log in, to make some orders, to uh, look at product information that was personalized down to individual level. And we won that contract, uh, and we did a lot of work down in Tamworth. And they were part of Burma Castrol, who were a huge organization, a global organization. And that project had gone so well with Burma Castrol that they said to us, listen, could you can, can, could you can do some more extra nets for us? Uh, mainly for Castrol, the Castrol brand. So we started to build more and more of these secure websites, really big projects. Um, and uh, they liked us so much that in 1998 they bought us. So they bought Company Net, which was fantastic from a personal point of view. But from a chief executive point of view, at that point we were quite a small company. But we suddenly we exploded both size but also with regards to office space. So we had to get new offices in Edinburgh. And we then started to travel around the world. So I would lead a team running big projects in America, building these big extra nets across Europe, down in South America, South Africa, in my kind of mid-30s. And it was just brilliant. I had a great leadership team. And I have to say, I thought this was my future. 
you know, I'd, I'd, I'd set up something from nothing. We built the business, we'd sold it, and I thought, this, I'm going to continue doing this for the rest of my life. We might sell the business again, or, you know, if we don't, it'll become a fantastic lifestyle business. Um, and then everything changed. In 2006, when I was 40, on this beautiful place called Arran. Uh, it's a place I'll never go to again, <laughs> but um, uh, it was the October, it's actually 10 years ago just about, it was October the 19th. Um, I was on holiday with my family, uh, both uh, my, my three children and my wife, and we'd been there for the first day, and I came out the car, and I felt incredibly weird, like I drank about 20 gallons of coffee. And then the next thing is, I got this cracking headache, and then I couldn't see out this eye. Uh, the next thing I can remember, if I look back now, I was being transferred to a little office, a little hospital in um, uh, Arran, and it doesn't have a major hospital, I have to say. And it, they got me across to Kilmarnock, and they got me transferred to the Western Edinburgh. And the doctors told my wife, because I was completely gaga, was told that I'd had what's called a paradoxical embolism. And that's very difficult to say when you've had a stroke, so I said, I, I, I've had a stroke. And the bottom line is, what happened was, that year I'd been to a conference in Boston with Microsoft, and I got a deep, deep vein, deep vein, sorry, DVT in my leg, uh, deep vein thrombosis, a wee bit of that had broken off, came up here, I've got a hole in my heart. The bad news is 20% of you will have a hole in your heart, I never knew that. And that <laughs> hits my brain. Uh, and that's what happened on Aaron. Now, physically, I was okay. Uh, yeah, I couldn't see out the eye. I uh, was a bit wobbly and so forth. But the, the kind of the main effects for me were both cognitively and emotionally. And let me just talk a wee bit about cognitively. Um, so from a cognitive point of view, the, the, kind of the initial problems were around speech and memory. Um, now, as I said earlier, when I was running Company Net, the, the, um, the speech thing obviously wasn't a problem. We used to pitch for people like Disney and Coke, who, who, who were our clients at the time. Uh, and I was in board, me board me meetings with them. Uh, after the stroke, and when I came out of hospital, there's a video of me sitting with my daughter, who would have been eight at the time, and was sitting there with my youngest son's first ABC books. And we're sitting there with this video, and I'm looking at it, and I'm at the section of B, and I couldn't say one word. And I'm looking at this, this big hairy thing, which is a bear, by the way, just to let you know, I do know what that is now. But at the time, I just didn't know what that was. Words just couldn't come out, I just couldn't speak properly, I couldn't put sentences together, uh, and I couldn't read at all. The other problem was memory. Memory was horrific. Uh, I couldn't remember the name of my family, I couldn't remember um, uh, passwords, little things, I couldn't remember what I'd done an hour ago. So when a doctor or my wife would ask me something, I would f forget instantly. And I still have that now, bizarrely. I, I have this feeling of that I'm still living in the now, which means anything that could have happened yesterday could have happened a month or a year ago or vice versa. Um, so they were the, um, the immediate effects of it. Uh, but my GP, who were brilliant, I have to say the NHS were fantastic, uh, they said actually there's more going on than just a bit of speech, a bit of... Uh, memory stuff, there's some cognitive problems going on there. So I got referred to a neuropsychologist in Edinburgh with the NHS, and he did lots of tests with me. And at the end of that, he basically says, Neil, and he doesn't do it on the technical point of view, but he says, Neil, you're completely knackered. Uh, in the sense that, yes, yeah, speech is gone, but that will come back slowly. Uh, you will lose words now and again when you get stressed, and you could probably hear that right now. Uh, and you will also, uh, you'll have problems with memories forever, with, with, with memory. But a thing called divided attention will, will never come back. Now, I know men are terrible at doing the more than one things, but when proper divided, divided attention goes, it is really difficult. And he says, your days of being a, uh, a chief executive are now gone. Uh, you're going to have to resign. And that was a real difficult time. So we're talking about a year, about an 18 months after it. It takes a long time to recover from a stroke. And I'm happy to take any questions at the end about anything I'm going to talk about, including strokes. And that moves in nicely to the emotional bit of, of what happened at that point, uh, the really big change in my life. And that was the emotional bit. I was a complete wreck, I have to say. I, for the first year, 18 months, I was very frustrated. I cried loads. I never used to cry. 
but I would burst out crying at the most inappropriate times. Um, I was very anxious, my moods were up and down. And the bad news for my wife and my children was I was at home all the time, you know, which she wasn't planning me to be retiring at 40. And if we were, we'd have planned to do that. But suddenly, here I was at home. Uh, and the big thing you start to do when you've had to have a massive change in your life is emotionally, you then start to question actually who you are. Uh, because prior to that, I had a proper purpose. That's what I saw it as. You know, I'd set something up. We'd built something, we'd been very successful, and that gave me real purpose uh, and pride, if I'm being honest, on what we'd done. Um, but more importantly, and you know, I'm you know, embarrassed to say this in some ways, it gave me a real status. Um, it gave me a badge, a badge that was I was a chief executive of a digital company. And when I walked into a, a, a party and people say, you know, what do you do? I'd say, well, you know, I'm a chief executive of a digital agency, you know. Now, those people probably thought I was an idiot. <laughs> but internally, the status it gave me was really important to me. And when that's ripped away from you, whether you've been made redundant or the people that you're, you're dealing with or you have something like a stroke, it's very, very difficult to, to cope with that emotionally uh, because your status goes and that badge goes. And I desperately tried to go back to work. Uh, and it was embarrassing. So I tried to go back to board meetings and I just couldn't say anything because I was trying to read things at the same time and talk. That's divided attention. I couldn't do that. And it was embarrassing for me and for the team. And for two years, I really struggled with that. Uh, that loss of status, that loss of significance, and also that loss of value uh, of, of who I was. And then fortunately, I was still seeing this neuropsychologist, David, uh, who's now a good friend, I have to say. Uh, and I would see him about every two weeks, every month for the first couple of years. And he really helped me you know, get myself together. And there was one session I can remember uh, when we were talking just about regret. Uh, and I was still desperately holding, trying to hold on to this old life of being a chief executive. And I burst out crying in front of him. And when I calmed down, he said, you know, what's going on? And I says, I just, you know, I just wish I could turn the clocks back. I wish I could just go back to where I was. And he says, you know what's going on, Neil? And I says, no. He says, you're grieving. You're going through the process of grieving. There's a part of you that has died in your brain. The old Neil, the chief executive, has gone. And that's not going to come back. And when he told me that, it was like a light bulb went on in my mind. Uh, and I thought, he's absolutely right, you know. And he said to me, he said, and the only way you'll get through it is you'll go through all the processes of grieving and you'll get to the point of acceptance. And when you get to acceptance, i.e. you've had a stroke and that, that's the way it is, uh, then your life might go forward. And that's exactly what happened. So when I got to the point of, and it didn't happen that day, I have to say, but after a couple of weeks, I started to think more and more about it. And I did come to the conclusion, I thought, actually, I just need to accept this. I, I'm not going to go back. There's no point regretting the decisions that have gone on. You know, you know, this is me, Neil Francis, ex-CEO with a stroke. What on earth was I going to do? And then the bizarre thing starts to happen. Uh, and uh, that, in about 2009, I think 2010, uh, me and my wife watched a program about the golfers in St. Andrews. And it was everything about the golfers, but not the golfers. And what it was about was about the green keepers, but it was mainly about the caddies. And my wife said to me, that's what you should do. You should caddy. And I thought, caddy? <laughs> From being a chief executive to a caddy? She says, yeah, no, you should be a caddy. Uh, you know, you love golf. Uh, it'll be great with your confidence. It will get you fit. And from her point of view, and she didn't say this, but I do know now, <laughs> it was to get me out of the house, as you well know. And so uh, that's what I did. And so I started caddying. And I live in a place uh, just out of, outside of Edinburgh uh, called North Berwick. It's about 20 miles outside of Edinburgh. It's, it's on the coast. It's a beautiful place. Uh, and it's got one of the most famous golf courses, certainly in Scotland and the UK. It's in the top 10 for golf courses in Scotland. And it's the 13th oldest golf course in the world, uh, or the second oldest, depends who you're arguing with. Uh, and it, we hold big competitions there. But critically, we get about 12 to 14,000 visitors per year that come to North Berwick to play golf. And these tend to be um, Americans or wealthy Europeans 
some Chinese and some Japanese. And those people tend to be either billionaires, millionaires, very successful business people, chief executives, um, s surgeons, sports people, uh, and they want people to caddy. They need caddies. And so I thought, I'm going to give a bash at that. I'm going to go and caddy. So I was a member at North Berwick, uh, and so I went down and see, saw the caddy master, who was brilliant, Sam. And he, at that time, he knew I still had problems with speech and so forth. He says, Neil, we'll get you out there. You'll enjoy it. And that's what I did. So in about 2010, I started caddying. Uh, my wife and Sam were absolutely great. They were absolutely right. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it from, the, from day one. Uh, and what it did, as Louise says, it started to give my confidence back. Um, it got me back into a routine. And suddenly, I was engaging with strangers, strangers that I used to be involved with before. Uh, so their worlds of being chief executives or venture capitalists, I understood because I understood that through building businesses and sell, selling businesses. And so when you started to, to caddy for these people, what normally would happen when you're walking up the first hall, the second hall, you get chatting to them and say, you know, where you're from, and you'll say, oh, I'm from New York, and, you know, this is what I do. And nine times out of ten, they'll say, and so what do you do? And I would say, well, you know, I'm a caddy, I've been it for about four, th three years or whatever. And then I would tell them a story about the, the chief executive and the, um, the stuff about the stroke. And they're absolutely fascinated about it. And they start to ask you more questions about it. And what that gave for me is a real feel, feeling of value and significance because they were really interested in my story. Now, the main thing is to get them around the golf course in the lowest course they can and give them some information about the history of, of the course. But they wanted to be engaged because they tend to be there for a week with their buddies and they've normally fallen out with them at that point when they were with them uh, and they just like to talk to somebody else and they like to hear some of the stories so i really started to get my confidence back and what i then started to find was a real purpose again which seemed weird uh, here i was ceo caddy but i was getting a significance feeling back and this purpose, but this badge of being a caddy, I felt great, again, of, of, of having that. And that really helped hugely with the healing process. And so, as I caddied for more of these people and the stories they would tell me, and they were really opening up to me because, because when you've had a serious health problem, for some reason, I don't know why, but people are more open to you and tell you stories about their lives. And they were telling me some really interesting stories about their own what they had that made them successful or some personal stories or some funny stories uh, uh, and the more and more I caddied with them the more I thought actually there's a theme developing here there's a theme of these stories and what I'm learning from all these sort of people is how to start again in life because that's what I had to do uh, because I was getting very inspired by some of the things I was saying and I was also finding out some of the mistakes that they'd made and the more and more I thought about it, I thought, there's a book here. There's a book in my head. I thought, there's a book about the CEO who became a caddy, and I'm going to call it Starting Again. And I can remember when I got that, that idea, I thought, this is a real purpose. Now I'm going to write a book. Now, in English, I was appalling at school, I have to say. Uh, you know, I got three O levels, so that's my kind of background. Um, and so I uh, remember running into the house and seeing my wife and my children and says, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be called The CEO to Caddy and it's going to be called, uh, uh, starting again, The CEO that became a Caddy. And my wife looked at me and my children said, Dad, you can't even speak properly, let alone write a book. And I said, son, children, you watch, I'm going to write a book. And that was, gave a huge purpose and a real drive for me to prove to myself that I could do that. Uh, and so what I did, I started to collect all these stories. So when I was out caddying, when the golfer didn't see, I might make some notes about some of the things they were saying about their lives. And I'd get home and I would keep a private blog of, of these stories. And when I got enough of this information, I thought, right, I'm now going to write this book. How on earth do you write a book? I had no idea. how to. You know, it sounds simple, but it's a real difficult process to go through. So a good friend had said, listen, you'd buy this book called The, the Writer's Handbook. Uh, which is a tomb, massive tomb of a book. And uh, I, I got this book and it showed me how to write it, but critically I had about 
all the agents and publishers in the world. Um, and I put together what's called a book proposal, that's what they asked me to do, and I got lots of help to do that. Uh, and then I sent it out to about 60 or 70 people, um, agents and publishers, over a period of about six to nine months, because uh, that's how long it took. And I then started to hear back from a few people saying, yeah, it's quite interesting, but it's not for us. And then suddenly, about six months after I sent all those proposals, I was in my office, I've got an office in the garden, and this email came in, and it went ping, as it normally does, and you open that, and in there, there was, a le there was an email from w the editor of one of the big publishers in America, that have an office in, in, in London, uh, called Hay House, and they do uh, mind, body, spirit, and motivational books. And they loved it. They loved the proposal. They loved the idea of this uh, CEO to caddy idea. And before I replied to them, I ran back into the house and I found my children and my wife and said, told you I was going to get the publishing deal. Uh, and then they invited me down to, America, uh, down to London and I um, uh, uh, did the deal. And then I had to write the book, which is a completely different story. And that, was, that would take uh, uh, at least another 25 minutes to explain that. Uh, and it came out in 2013. I'm still caddying. Uh, and there were, there were about 20 or 25 articles, big articles in the newspapers about me. Uh, this was one. This is from Golf Monthly, which is the biggest golf magazine in the UK. But there's a lot of stuff in the business, um, business press and uh, lots of other uh, press. So there was lots of radio and TV stuff and so forth. And the book came out uh, in 2013. And... I've, spoke to, uh, I've been speaking at lots of events and so forth. Uh, but going back to the caddying, so the book was one thing, which was a weird thing, I have to say, <laughs> even when I still look at it and go, I can't believe that's actually happened. Um, I still continue to caddy. And the other big thing that came out of it uh, was probably about five years ago, so I've been caddying you know, for about three years at that point. Uh, a lot of people I was caddying for um, not only were telling me stories, but they were giving me real encouragement and motivation to go back into the world of work, the real world, i.e. your world. Um, and they all understood I wouldn't be a chief executive again, but they were basically saying that you do have skills and talents and experience that other businesses that would be interested in. And the more they said that, the more I thought, yeah, you know, they're right. They are. I'm going to go back into the world of work. I won't be going to get a full-time work, full-time job again because I won't be able to do that. But the only way I knew how to do that was to network, um, and so I started to network. And some of the old networks that I used to knew, the old technical world and the, the digital world, um, but with, with some new networks like these sort of events, I would network, and that eventually proved very fruitful uh, because I got involved with a venture capitalist in Newcastle. Uh, who about five years ago were looking to make new investments in digital companies in the Northeast. And they were looking for people with my experience of running businesses, working with big corporates, and all that sort of stuff. And so I, um, I got involved with them. Uh, and so I've done now five uh, non execs for them, um, which has, has been great. And these are kind of st startup revenue up to about a million. Uh, so I'm involved with these sort of businesses who are looking not from kind of the, the non-exec of just monitoring how the business is doing, but it's more about mentoring these young people uh, who've set up businesses. And so I said, uh, currently now I'm on the board of three businesses, um, and I'm also on the board of two social enterprises. One is called Sporty Memories, and we do work with dementia, people with dementia using sport as a way to, 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 to reach out to them. And I also uh, am involved with a, an organization that's not here called the Together Partnership, and we do business relationships between here and Rwanda. But I've got these three other, these non-execs at the moment. Going forward, uh, I'll continue to do that. Um, bizarrely, 20 years on since I set company that up, I'm now helping my son to set up his own digital company, which uh, is an interesting experience, which I'm sure you know <laughs> how that feels with your son. Um, and I've got a, a second publishing deal. Uh, so I've got my second book coming out. of the It's called The Entrepreneur's Course, which is more aimed at entrepreneurs. Now, why do I tell you all this? Okay? <laughs> uh, it's not to say, wow, you know, how great am I? Because it's not about that. It's, it's to say that, you know, 
once upon a time, you know, my life I thought was an absolutely in one direction and I thought nothing was going to change that. Um, and then suddenly, drastically happened. Uh, and everything changed from, from my point of view. And for those first couple, two to three years, were really, really difficult. And I would leave you with these thoughts. If you're in the position of whether you're having to change course or you're thinking of changing course, whether you're going to set up your own business or you're having to deal with the people uh, that, that, that Tim's having to work with who have been forced to change course, I would leave you with these three little things just to think about. And I'm sure you understand what they are. But the first is, this thing about acceptance is really important, whatever you're going to do in change. Yeah? Um, and this is a quote from J.K. Rowling, which is a really good quote, actually. She's basically saying, understanding is the first step to acceptance, and only with acceptance can there be recovery. Understanding, when I understood that I would never be a chief executive again, and then I understood that, I would not, um, that, that I'd had the stroke, then I eventually got to acceptance. And when I got to acceptance, from this really bad thing, things really started to happen for me. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. Secondly, and I will, I'll leave this quote for you at the moment, I've always believed in this strengths philosophy. So pre the stroke, I've, I've never bought this idea that if you work really hard, you can achieve anything. I've never got that. I've always believed in that we're given talents, natural talents, and if you focus on those, you're likely to do better than you try and do everything. And I definitely found that out when I'd had the stroke, without doubt, you know, that I grew stronger when I focused on things that would naturally come to me. No, I'm not talking skills, experience, I'm talking about talents. That was incredibly useful for me. And I put together a, uh, a rule uh, book in my head in certain things I would do and I wouldn't do. And I would make sure that anything I did, I would focus on my strengths. And lastly, and this is not mind, body, spirit sort of stuff or new age stuff, but it's this, and it's quite important actually because it's something that's really helped me, is I trust that, um, sorry, that, uh, well, uh, I trust that new opportunities will appear uh, and that will give me purpose. And the best way to, to describe what I mean by that uh, is, a, is a speech or a thing that Steve Jobs did. May, may have you all seen the thing called the Stanford Address, which Steve Jobs does, where he speaks to all the students in, in Stanford University in 2005. If you've not seen that, Google it when you get home. It's, he'll have much better speech than mine, but have a look at that because it's brilliant. But one of the things he talks about, he talks about dots, and dots to him in his life are ra and what seem originally random dots, ra random events. And he talks about the time when he was young, he'd been kicked out of college, but he was allowed to stay at college, and uh, he popped into a course about calligraphy. Uh, and he'd never seen anything about calligraphy, but he was really motivated by seeing this, uh, these beautiful letters, and you could do wonderful things with it. But he thought that was just a random event when he was like 19, 20. Ten years on, when, he wrote the, when they built the Mac and they came to the meeting about typefaces, he remembered how inspired he was by uh, calligraphy. And he said, when we build the Mac, we'll have beautiful uh, fonts that PCs won't have. And that changed the direction of computing. Um, and he, though, this is his quote basically saying, so what seems random events, one day, if you trust, will get connected to take you on a new path. And that's definitely what's happened to me. So when I look at the stroke, it was a horrific random point in my life. Um, but there was a random event of when I watched that TV program. There was a random event when I went down to see the caddy master, there was a random event when I started to meet these people, and then suddenly there was this random event, I'm going to write a book. And they all led together. I can look back now and say, if I'd not had that stroke, I would not be standing here today saying, you know, my life today is better, and I genuinely mean this, with brain damage, than, than I was when I was a chief executive when I ran my own business. And that's my philosophy in life now. So. I will probably leave here because I've probably talked probably too much. So I'll just leave you with that. You know, it's just acceptance, strength, and trusting that you will get, you, you'll get real purpose if you just believe that at some point things will turn uh, to, to the better. So I'll stop at that point there.